Hi, good morning. Happy Thursday. Uh, I am Sarah Smith. I'm a horticulturalist here at Rogers Gardens. And on Thursday, I'm usually bringing to you during the summertime uh, the plant of the week for the hummingbirds because this summer we are doing, this is our second round of this, uh, the um, Hummingbird Summer Program, uh, which has really, really been a fun program. It was super fun and really successful last year. So we're doing it again this year. Um, and it's basically where we highlight different hummingbird plants uh, that the hummingbirds really like. We have a ton of different kinds of beautiful feeders. We have a lot of really fantastic hummingbird food that's different than just using plain sugar and water. Uh, it's a really good quality hummingbird food that's uh, made with different natural uh, ingredients and is more balanced for the hummingbirds. So instead of basically just giving them junk food, <laughs> you're giving them uh, something that has a lot more nutritional value to it, uh, which is really fantastic. Um, and then we're featuring all the different hummingbird plants and we have them all together in one area. So what's really funny about that is the hummingbirds figure that out super fast. And in this whole area, we have a ton of hummingbird activity and it's really, really fun, specifically in this archway where I'm standing. Uh, it's really funny in the morning, they all like to hang out here. As soon as I start talking, they kind of freak out a little bit and all take off. But I do find that ten, they tend to kind of come back at the end of the live stream and I get buzzed uh, by all the different hummingbirds and things. So uh, it's been a really, really fun experience. So today's plant of the week is uh, Salvia gregii, uh, autumn sage. This is like a hardier salvia. So there's a lot of different types of salvia, uh, but this is the particular plant of the week. And we have a lot of really beautiful colors um, for it and I'm going to tell you a little bit how to care for it, how to cut it back, how to fertilize it, how to plant it, what it needs, all that kind of stuff and then at the end I'll answer questions for you too. So uh, let's get into it. So this is salvia. There's a lot of different kinds of salvia but this is salvia gregii um, and it comes in a lot of different colors. I couldn't even put all the different colors here on this table but there is white, uh, there is red and white called hot lips which is <laughs> I think somebody a lot of different people's favorite um, and then um, uh, purples and pinks uh, as well. So they're really beautiful, really kind of neat flowers. Um, they're a little bit shorter and a little bit more compact in the way of how they grow um, compared to some of the other kind of like blue spires and all those kind of ones. So um, what's really nice about this is that um, it doesn't require a lot of water, uh, doesn't want to be over fertilized. So it's a very easy plant in the way that it's not super needy um, and is a really good companion plant to things like roses and succulents and stuff like that. That's also low water as well. So uh, it's a very water wise plant, which is great. Um, and I love, love, love all the different colors. And what's really kind of fun is when you watch the hummingbirds actually come up to feed on these, uh, they stick their little beaks in and there's a little stamen piece that um, kind of hits the top of their head. So you'll notice a lot of the hummingbirds as they're flying around, if they slow down enough that you can actually see them, they have this funny kind of like line of pollen on the top of their heads. Uh, some of them even will have like a perfect little dot um, from coming in, but you can see how when they stick it in, it actually triggers. So just think about how like snapdragon dragons how we pinch them it makes them like talk essentially it triggers them and that little piece comes down uh and bonks them right on the head so uh they're really really beautiful plants i really like them planted between roses because they have very similar requirements uh these are a plant uh that are native to areas of like texas and down into mexico um and they're on typically very like rocky hillsides so that's why i have this cactus mix here uh they do not want to be in like super super fertile super rich soil uh, they need a little bit more of that like kind of sharpness to the soil. So um, if you're planting it in a pot, the cactus mix is fantastic. You can mix it 50-50, uh, but if you only have cactus mix, use the cactus mix because they actually really like that. Um, when it comes to fertilizing, they don't need a ton of fertilizer. Um, a little bit of the rose and flower fertilizer will work totally fine, um, but they don't need a ton of it. So in fact, I don't even fertilize mine. Mine get the runoff fertilizer from when I'm fertilizing my roses because they're near my roses. So I don't actually put fertilizer right up underneath them uh, because they don't really need that. And they don't, uh, they don't, you can over fertilize them. In fact, if it's too rich. So you want to stay away from that. Um, they don't need a lot of fussing. Uh, you can definitely deadhead them. So if you're looking at them and they're looking kind of like a little straggly, like they're sort of finished up, uh, you can definitely give them a little cut back to encourage a new flush of growth. So when you're looking at um, the flowers, for example, um, this is looking so great. I really kind of hesitate to deadhead anything, but I'm going to show you when you're looking at where the flower is, 
In fact, I'm just gonna take this piece off so I can pull this above. So when you're looking at that main stem, right? You can see the two little side growths to that, right? So this is the main stem. When that stem is done and ready, you're gonna go down to that area right above those two and you're gonna cut it right there. Those will flush out and those will bloom. So there's flowers there, there's flowers on either side here, there's flowers on either side there. So if you continue to do that, um, which is a lot of fussy, busy work, so it's not totally necessary, but if you really wanna have a super immaculate garden uh, and you wanna keep it really, really pretty, uh, you can cut that down and that will encourage that to go. You should at least do one round of this, but you don't need to go out every single week and deadhead it like you do your roses. But as I'm out there deadheading my roses, I'll do a little bit of it. I'm not too intense with trimming this back, um, but that keeps it nice and compact and green and that keeps it from getting a woody bottom. So I do see that if people don't cut them back at all, they tend to kind of get taller and taller and have a very woody bottom and very green on top. So and that's not a really pretty look. So if we keep it cut back a little bit, keep a dead head here and there, and we do our once a year big trim, and we'll get into that in a second, uh, that will keep it really nice and green all the way down to the bottom and really full and really lush looking. Uh, so that's something you really want to pay attention to. Um, when you do a big cut back, you're going to do your big cut back in early spring. So for us really here, because we're so mild, that's even kind of like late winter. And what you'll notice is you'll notice a lot of new growth coming from the bottom woody kind of stuff. And you're going to start cutting back down to that. So you're going to probably hopefully already have uh, your roses cut back by that point. Um, so you could go through and cut back all of your salvia too, because if you don't do that, they're going to keep getting bigger and bigger and taller and taller and more woody on the bottom and you don't get that growth down below. So that's why deadheading and things like that and just shape pruning here and there is really, really important for perennial plants because you want to force new growth down from the bottom. If you don't, they get that kind of woody kind of skeletony bottom looking that's not very, very pretty. Um, so if you do that big cut back, that's pretty good. And you can go to like almost like two thirds of the way down on uh, salvia, especially the woody salvias like that. That's totally fine. You'll notice what we call basal growth. So that's the new growth that comes out from underneath but other than that they're really really easy plants full sun is key um, if you're in a really really hot region so let's say you're like in palm desert or uh, you know that area out in the desert over there um, you want to make sure that maybe you're giving them a little bit of afternoon uh, shading to just kind of keep them happy and not get them too fried you want to stay away especially in hot areas like that from putting it up against any kind of like glass uh, sliding glass doors or like really hot reflective uh, walls because you'll notice a little bit of scorching on there. Um, that will pretty much happen with any plant. If you live in the hot desert, you probably have learned that already, um, that that reflective heat can be pretty detrimental on your plants. So um, make sure that you're you're thinking about that. But around here, full sun is key. If they're in too much shade, what's gonna wind up happening is they're gonna get kind of leggy. So that will make them kind of tall and kind of lanky. They don't get that fullness anymore. So you wanna make sure that they're getting at least six hours, at least six hours of sun. Um, really, really great in pots. Uh, you can get them in these nice uh, gallons, which are pretty full size here. These Salvia gregiae, they call them autumn sages too. Um, but we have them in one gallon. Sometimes we even have them in little four inch containers too. So the little tiny four by four containers. So uh, they're really a, a good uh, complement to a lot of different, more drought tolerant kind of plants. So would be really good with the lantanas, really great with roses, um, even planted in some like succulent areas that you're lightly irrigating uh, is a nice to add a little bit of uh, kind of flower and texture to it uh, because they definitely have that fine texture. So they're really nice paired with something with a bigger, more bold texture. Um, when you're thinking about planting an area, like if you have like some hummingbird feeders and you're trying to bring some hummingbirds in and you're thinking about planting an area, think about making sure that all the texture isn't too fine and wild and crazy because it starts to look a little busy, right? So we want to stay away from that. So this is a really good thing to add that kind of fine texture, very upright uh, 
and uh, like I said, great in pots. Use the cactus mix, they'll be absolutely fine in pots, uh, which is really great. And the hummingbirds go crazy for these, so it's really fun. And it doesn't have to just be red. That's a really big common misconception. I do have this nice, beautiful red, but they will go to all the colors. Uh, they like all the colors. Uh, so they'll go to the pinks, they'll go to the purples, they'll go to all of that too. So if you have a population in your garden, they will be going to the other colors as well. They're always looking for those short kind of tubular flowers. So, and again, think about Texas, Mexico, right? Like what are they looking for there? It's rocky soil, uh, full um, sun, not too much uh, in the way of fertilizer and stuff like that because you can actually over fertilize these. So you wanna stay away from that. So like I said, mine just get a little bit of runoff from my rose fertilizer. I don't actually fertilize them individually because uh, I actually don't need it. So if we have any questions, we'll answer those questions. The things I do wanna remind you about real quick is the um, Sea and Sage Autobahn Society is gonna be here uh, on the 16th, this Saturday, uh, which is really amazing. They're a really great group. They're the local chapter um, of the Autobahn Society here. Uh, they do a lot of amazing work through education, Conservation, um, just keeping everybody educated on, you know, how to, hum, you know, do hummingbird feeders and how to be a responsible hummingbird feeder owner. It does take a little bit of work. Uh, they are relying on you for food once you put it out there. So you need to make sure you're feeding them the right things. You're keeping it clean, um, and you're keeping them. See, they're starting to come. Once, once I talk a little bit, they kind of calm down and they're like, "Oh, okay, she's not scary. I'll come hang out." So maybe we'll get a glimpse of one or two in the end here. Um, but they have a lot of amazing photos they can help you with IDing things IDing all the different kinds of hummingbirds here we have a lot of Anna's and Allen's around so uh, you'll definitely get glimpses of hummingbirds here guarantee it uh, so yeah it's they're a really great group so definitely come in and check that out it's really fun so um, I'll answer some questions and then if you came into this late too or we don't get to your question for some reason we'll answer your questions for you down in the comments below too so if we wrap up a little bit early and you didn't get your question answered don't worry we will get to it do they look nice mixed yeah absolutely um there's and again there's a lot of different colors there's some whites and stuff i have some whites but they just weren't looking excellent absolutely prime so these were the ones that i was thinking looked really the prettiest um but yeah i think the um the whites are really beautiful the um the ones that we call hot lips that have the white and red are really kind of cool when you do like a patch of the white and red and a patch of the red alone and a patch of the white alone is really kind of nice. Um, I definitely think doing them in drifts where you're doing kind of one color or graduating the color looks really nice. Uh, but they do really well with a lot of other plants because they are not picky, uh, which is which is really nice. Not picky in the way of they don't need to be too babied and too fussed with. So they do well with plants that you kind of ignore. You know, we have those certain things that we like really baby and we fertilize all the time, like our camellias and even our roses take, you know, a little bit more work. Uh, they don't want to be like that so they're gonna go really well in that garden and if you're the kind of gardener who's like you know i intend to fertilize but i always kind of forget it <laughs> this is a good plant for you because it doesn't need that uh so this would be a perfect plant for a, a beginner um, and just remember that big trim down that's really the biggest thing i find uh when i see them in yards and i'm looking at them going this don't look great i can look at it and tell they have not done that once a year trim back that once a year trim back will keep it really pretty it'll keep it really um dense and really green foliage like perfect like this like this looks beautiful right now it's got all kinds of green growth down below um when i see those ones where the green growth has like reached just the ends and the bottom's very very woody and it's gotten pretty tall that's because they haven't done a cutback so at springtime cutback and you'll look at it and if you're just i tell everybody to learn to be in tune with your garden and just going out once a week and just kind of looking at everything checking everything you'll notice that it's telling you it's ready to be pruned because it's going to grow all this little tiny green growth down from the bottom um, and you'll notice hmm i've got all this old growth that's not very pretty looking with old flower stems on it that are totally spent but i have all this little lush beautiful basil growth on the bottom that's what they call it and it looks so perfect and pretty cut down to that and it'll flush out all over again so if you're really like watching your garden i think keeping a garden diet diary is a great thing. I did that in the beginning. I kept a diary. Um, we do a once a um, month checklist too. Uh, that's a live stream. David Rizzo does it uh, the first Saturday of every month. That's a really great resource and definitely check that out because that's always the first Saturday of every month. That's when I kind of do all my like 
monthly stuff is always at the first of the month. Like I fertilize all my roses at the first of the month. I do my blueberries at the first of the month. I pay attention to all that kind of stuff. And I do a lot of my work at that point. Uh, so that way I'm not like, when did I fertilize last? Because if I just do it willy nilly, I'll never remember. Um, but that's a really great resource. And we'll tell you what kind of things to do, what kind of stuff needs maintenance, what kind of stuff is good to plant right now. So if you want to do, you know, annual plantings and things like that, uh, it's all the information there. And if you don't have time to sit down and watch it and you just want to kind of like read through something really fast, it's on our website too. So the monthly checklist is in the learning section of, um, our website. It is fantastic. It talks about every plant under the sun. I mean, there's stuff that I'm just skimming through because I'm like, I don't grow poinsettias outside. But if you do, there's information for you on what to do to your poinsettias. It's every plant you can possibly think of, which is really amazing. So that's really, really helpful because some things are particular. Azaleas, camellias, super particular, super particular on when you cut them back, hydrangeas, same thing. So all that information is there. So that's such a great thing. And I still read through it all the time because it's very, very well written. It's really amazing. And I just kind of skim through it because there's, yeah, I don't have every plant under the sun. So I don't have any gardenias at home. That may change because I found one that I really liked, but I don't have any gardenias at home and I don't maintain anybody's yards anymore like I used to. So I don't really remember when is it time to feed a gardenia. I have to read that and remind myself every once in a while. So um, it's a really, really great resource. And I definitely suggest everybody check that out so you know what to do uh, in the garden and you're not like, oh gosh, I'm like three months behind on <laughs> doing that particular thing. So it's really fantastic. So anyways, that was a tangent. Do we have any other questions? I have a mature bush. Mm -hmm. When do I trim it and how far back? So that's something you'll do in the springtime. You can do a light trimming on it now. Totally fine. Uh, if you have any kind of stems uh, where the flowers are looking kind of spent or you're just looking at it going, it just doesn't look good, go ahead and do a trim now. And like I said, with that one that I cut, so this, sorry for jumping off camera here real quick. That one that I cut off, you'll see that this is where the original stem was from that first growth, right? So you have something in the middle. You can cut down to these little things. So if you look at it and go, okay, I see a lot of nice little growth kind of like maybe a quarter of the way down, cut down to that. Um, that will flush out some new growth. Um, make sure that you're keeping it pretty well watered after you cut it back because we're a little hot, not like super soggy. They don't need super soggy water. Um, when you first plant them, a little bit of water to get them established when you're trying to water deep to get those roots to break out of that little root ball and go down into the soil. When you give it a, a good cut back, just make sure you sure you keep it well watered because we are going to get hot, believe it or not. Um, and when you first cut something down, you are exposing some of the new leaves that are used to being protected uh, to more sun. Uh, so just make sure you just maybe give it a little extra dose of water for that time um, and cut down to anything that has little side by side growth like that. Um, and that will help kind of flush out some new growth. So you get some good uh, flowers going on right now because you're really going to start flowering um, from the summer to autumn. That's why they call them autumn sages. Uh, so they go all the way through which is really beautiful so uh, give it a little cut back um, maybe a smidge bit of fertilizer just a rose and flower fertilizer is fine don't go crazy don't go uh, giving it a ton of that uh, but put a little bit of that fertilizer in a little bit of water it's not that they can't have fertilizer they just don't require a lot of it and over fertilizing uh, is not great for them uh, but give it a little bit at the recommended amount or just half the amount and then um, you can flush out some new stuff and just keep doing that through the season so if you have a super lanky one where you're like ooh, I've never cut it back and it's like five years old go ahead and just do a little light pruning on it wait maybe another two months and do that and do that and do that until the flowers are kind of done then leave it you're gonna leave you don't keep pruning it back like once we hit november stop don't do any more pruning just let it be um and then in the springtime that's when you'll see new growth coming up from the bottom then give it that big hard prune back so and you can totally revive it it's funny i feel like these are kind of the phoenixes of the the plant world where you can definitely take something that looks horrible cut it back and it comes out all brand new all over again right so uh they're a really pretty easy plant to kind of bring back from the brink of not looking so great right uh so they're a good plant in that regard so absolutely what is a good companion plant for it? So anything that is uh, full sun and requires some good... Uh 
uh, good draining soil. So uh, they like roses even. Roses do like fertile soil, but they don't like soggy, soggy soil. These are not going to like soggy soil either. Uh, and just think full sun. The nice thing is with most of all the hummingbird plants, like if we look around at all the different hummingbird plants and what I was planning on doing for my little last one is kind of making a little mini bouquet of all the different things that I had talked about through the whole entire summer. Um, most of it requires very similar stuff with the exception of th some things like uh, the fuchsias and uh, the um, Chinese lanterns, the butylons, uh, those want some more shade, but like the um, lantanas are really great with this. The monkey flower is super great with this. The hummingbird mint, which we've talked about already, super, super good with this. Um, and pretty together, they have very similar colors. It's, it's nice that uh, hummingbirds, and if you're attracting hummingbirds, you're also getting bees and butterflies guaranteed. Uh, they like really bright, really showy, beautiful flowers. So, and they all go very well together, which is really fantastic. And these even would be planted well with um, succulents and things too, because they don't require a lot of water and they require really good drainage. Uh, so once you get these established, they're definitely low water because again, if you think about where they come from, and that's why it's really kind of cool. Every once in a while when I pick up a plant and I don't really know a lot about it, the first thing I do is I look up, where is it native to? That gives me an idea of how to treat it and what it's looking for. Uh, so this is native along Texas, Mexico region uh, in the high kind of rocky uh, area. So that tells me it wants good drainage. Uh, it wants like cactus mix, doesn't need a lot of fertilizing. Uh, so it will do really great with that kind of stuff as well. Can salvias be transplanted? Trans, yep. They can, um, anything can, um, but they're kind of, uh, a little woody and delicate. So you have to be careful with these. Um, I sometimes find that like if we get a, a, a big group of these in and they come in on like big trucks and stuff and the guys kind of just shoved them in there and they weren't super careful with how they packed them into the truck and they come out, um, we'll get a lot of breakage on them, um, which is always really frustrating. And I'm like, be more gentle <laughs> because you're breaking them. Um, so you have to be really careful because they are kind of brittle uh, in a way. So they actually like, I can snap off uh, branches pretty easily off of this by just actually pinching it off. It, they are a little brutal. I just did that with my, or a little brittle. I just did that with my hands. So. Um, you just want to be really careful when you're doing it and expect a little bit of breakage. Um, dig down low and deep into the ground and try to get as much of the root ball as you can. That's really the key with any kind of thing that you transplant. And I wouldn't do it now. Uh, I wouldn't really do a lot of transplanting when it's hot because the plant's going to be stressed. It's hot. The upper part of the soil has uh, heated up a lot uh, and that can definitely be an issue. So I would wait. I would wait really till the springtime to move something if you absolutely can't well okay uh just be really careful and expect that uh, there's a chance that it might not make it um there are things like super thrive and stuff that you can put in that will kind of help um with transplant shock and things like that as well um does that really work i don't know i feel like it kind of, i do it sometimes sometimes i don't and i feel like I have the same luck either way. So, um, but yeah, uh, I would wait when it's a little bit cooler. We're going to definitely get like heat spike this weekend. So maybe wait until you see, like, look at the temperature, make sure the temperature is cooled down. That will definitely make you more successful for transplanting. I have a problem with my Anna bird bowling the other birds. Any advice? Oh yeah. <laughs> so, um, the hummingbirds. So an Anna is a, is a type of hummingbird. Uh, the hummingbirds are super duper territorial. It is so funny. Uh, I like to lovingly call them the chihuahuas of the bird world. Uh, they're like these tiny little super aggressive little tiny birds and they, they like to fight each other and chase each other around. Uh, and it's really funny because a lot of times when we get buzzed here walking through the store, it's usually two birds chasing each other. Um, if you have hummingbird feeders up, make sure you have multiples up and make sure you have them far away from each other. I would say like 20 feet apart so that way uh, they have have different areas but that's just kind of how they are uh, they are going to be they're gonna chase each other around like that having a water source is really important for them uh, so I have uh, a nice fountain with like a very shallow bowl uh, that has running water so that attracts them the running water keeps it clean uh, keeps it from getting mosquitoes and things like that uh, but having multiples around if you can is really helpful um, 
they're just they're aggressive little birds like that that's just kind of how they roll um, but multiple feeders will help uh, having plants kind of spread out so they're not all close together uh, but yeah I was noticing this morning there was one that kept chasing everybody away too that's just that's the nature of the hummingbirds <laughs> but they're so funny to watch I kind of weirdly enjoy it uh, they like we had a meeting early this morning uh or actually yesterday morning and one was sitting on uh, a little statue and it was just yelling at everything that was walking by it was just so funny and it was just sitting there it was all fluffed up and all angry looking and i took a little video of it because it was just kind of cute in a weird way <laughs> but this tiny little thing's like this is my spot get away it was just so funny um but that's just kind of how they are multiple feeders more plants uh, multiple sources of water will help for sure do they recede reseed themselves or are they easy to propagate from clippings for me to add more to my year i have form? seen them reseed but not often um but i have seen that happen if you want to get them to reseed though the key is do not deadhead them <laughs> because that's where all the seeds are going to come from right yeah. uh, i have seen them reseed um i have not tried propagating them uh i i don't do a lot of plant propagation i'm really really lucky and i work in a nursery <laughs> so i don't do a lot of plant propagation because i have so much uh at my fingertips of stuff all ready to go um but uh using rooting hormone will definitely work when you're getting into woody stuff that will help um making sure that when you're propagating them propagating into really really well draining soil uh will help so something like cactus mix or mixing in like perlite into um, other potting soil will help too um but i have seen them reseed but you have to let them go to seed uh to get to that point and that's when they look a little rangy um but yeah i have seen that and rooting hormone will definitely help to a good good draining soil do not propagate a woody cutting with rooting hormone into uh like just regular potting mix uh that's when you're going to start having problems with it rotting out uh you want to make sure that it drains really really well yeah so okay if we have any more questions just go ahead and stick them down below and we'll answer those for you later of course um and then don't forget the cn sage audubon society is coming in um and if you haven't signed up for our email list what are you waiting for there's so much amazing information we always put all kinds of really cool videos out for you uh to tell you about all the new stuff that's going on in the gardens um from you know what's coming out for halloween to christmas to father's day gifts to uh the plant of the week to the plant of the month which is our buy two get one free deals um we have painters who come in that you can watch them actually paint here in the store which is really fantastic and super fun uh to just all kinds of cool things what our cocktails are at the um farmhouse there's always different cocktails and we are donating money for that um we do have a uh, sea and sage um roundup so anything that you purchase uh will round up the change if you are interested and we will match that too which is super great we have our monarch tree which is fantastic covered 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 nice little beautiful wooden um monarchs that are a little cut out and they're painted orange uh you can write your wish on there and it's a donation to the xerces society uh which is a conservation society for all things bug um and uh we are already up to three thousand nine hundred dollars for donations to that so that is fantastic news uh so that tree's beautiful and you can write uh your wish on that and it gets hung up in the tree uh so there's just all kinds of really fun stuff going on and you'll know about that uh if you are on our email list so uh make sure you do that and then um obviously you're probably watching us on instagram or on facebook uh we do these every tuesday and thursday and it's always kind of fun stuff one well, just buzz by every time i'm doing my closing this is when they come by um but every tuesdays and thursdays at 9 30 uh so you can get all kinds of really fun information there and that first of the month every saturday is the monthly checklist and that's fantastic david rizzo uh if you know him at all from coming into the store he's a wealth of knowledge and he'll give you all that information there as well so so thank you so much for tuning in and be well and be safe and happy gardening. Bye.